All right, from verse 33. And they said unto him, Why did the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? And he said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. Now, what I want to preach about this morning is this concept of a new bottle. Because we're starting this church, you know, ever since, uh, you know, me and Michael have started getting excited about starting this new church and planting it somewhere. We, we had originally actually aimed for Campsie, but just the places in Campsie were, were a bit too expensive. We wanted to try and stay somewhere in the city of Canterbury because for some reason we, we wanted to be in that middle area be- between Lighthouse and churches we knew further away to reach this area here. So we wanted to you know, reach every door in the city of Canterbury. That want, wanted to be one of our goals. Um, so I wanted, wanted to preach about this new bottle. So, so when we started getting excited about this new church and started to get exciting about what we were going to do here, we started calling this new church the new bottle. Because I don't know about you guys, but sometimes in churches... It's very hard to change things because, you know, people get used to the traditions, they get used to the way things are done. And, you know, sometimes if you want to fix or you want to improve things or you want to change something, sometimes you need to start over. And this is what Jesus is talking about here in this passage. And he gives us two examples. He talks about a a garment, a, a piece of clothing, saying, you know, if you have an old piece of clothing, you're not going to take a new piece of clothing to fix the old piece of clothing. Why? Because you're going to rend the new piece. You're going to ruin the new piece of clothing. And then when you try and use that material to fix the old piece of clothing, it's not even going to match. It's better if you just totally replace it and you have a new garment. So no man does that with clothing. And then he says here, no man putteth new wine into old bottles. Now, I, am, I don't know the science behind this. I do know that to make wine, it ferments and it creates carbon dioxide gas. Maybe an older bottle that's already been used is weakened uh, and ca- cannot take the strain of, of, that, of that gas that is coming out. But Jesus says here, no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. So ever since I started thinking about the concept of this church and what I believe Jesus wanted us to do in a church, I always thought of this passage because, you know, before, you know, trying to go against established traditions was just too hard. And I just thought, you know what we need? We need a new bottle. We need a new bottle with the new wine pointing back to Jesus Um, to put this new wine into and you know let's turn to revelation 21 and i know i'll say turn to revelation 21 but i'm going to have the verses up there anyway i'm just in the habit of saying this but you know this whole idea of starting again of starting new um this is this is how god does things and i don't know how if you guys have ever seen this before but i hopefully uh, uh i hope i hope that this is interesting to you but let's look at revelation 21 and we'll just read verses 1 to 5 Uh, It says here, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his God, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen for that. And he that sat upon the throne said, now look at this, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So we see there that the 
first heaven and the first earth passed away. And then we see a new heaven and a new earth. So God didn't try to fix the old heaven and the old earth. He got rid of it and replaced it with a new heaven and a new earth. He says there in verse 5, Behold, I make all things new. Now check this out. Turn to Hebrews. Hebrews 1. And I don't know if you've seen this before, but this, this is this kind of cool when I saw it. Um, and, and it was revealed to me. Look at what it says here in Hebrews 1 verse 10. And maybe you've read over this, but just never made the connection. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. So it's talking about the creation of heaven and earth, right? Now, now look at this. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. Remember what we read in Luke 5, how Jesus said, you don't take an old garment, uh, yeah, a new garment, and fix an old garment, and now... The heaven and earth is being likened to a garment. Verse 12, And as a vesture, so another word for clothing, shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall fail not. Now isn't that interesting? That Jesus said, you know, no man, uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly, no man, you know, taketh an old garment and, and, and fixes it with a new, right? And isn't it interesting there that when God talks about the heaven and the earth, he likens it to that same parable of the earth and the heaven being a garment. So, you know, God's methods are the same. He doesn't fix things that are broken. He fixes it by totally replacing it. Now, when, when Michael and I were out soul winning, we, um, we spoke to this lady in San Susi. And the thought is very similar. When you, when you talk to a lot of people about Jesus, about the Bible, one objection you always get is what? If there's a loving God... Why is there so much death and suffering in the world? And in fact, I, I'm, I'm putting together a sermon just to address that question because I think it's a very important question that we understand because it seems that a lot of people have rejected God because of that. And there was this video that went out recently. I don't know if you guys saw it on Facebook or on YouTube of a famous atheist basically mocking God and, and saying, if you were to, one guy asked him, if you were to meet God, what would you say? And he started saying, oh, you know, God, bone cancer? Basically that same question of, you know, if you're there, if you are all-powerful, if you're, you know, can, 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 can do anything, why are you allowing all this death and suffering in the world? And they basically asked the question, why isn't God doing anything about it? Right? And this is what this lady in San Susi was saying. She was saying, well, if there's a God, he did a pretty terrible job. You know, basically saying, what is God doing about all the death and suffering in this world? Well, what they have to understand is that, you know, God's methods are not their methods. And when, when they say, what is God doing about it? It's not that God has not done anything about it. It's that God is not doing what they think he should do about it. Because God has done something about it. Because 2,000 years ago, he stepped into humanity. He became, a, he became a man, you know, born of a virgin, died on the cross, rose again so that all of us could be saved. Because God is not trying to preserve this world. Like he says here, he's going to make all things new. He's going to be making a new heaven and a new earth. So people are looking at the old heaven and the old earth, which is the one we're on now, and saying, why, why isn't God doing anything about it? Why isn't God fixing all the problems here? Because that's not what God, has, that's not his plan. That's not what he's going to do about it. What he's doing about it is, I'm going to make a new heaven and a new earth, and we want as many people from the old heaven and the old earth to be saved and to be washed from their sins so they can be on the new heaven and the new earth. That's what God has done. Um, so people that think, you know, what, has, what is God doing about it? Well, they're not understanding what God has done about it, and that's what we have to share with them. And obviously they're not going to understand because they, you know, they're in the flesh, they, they may not be saved, and they're just looking at uh, the physical things. But I thought that was a really interesting comparison there but let's also turn to Romans 8 Romans 8 verse 22 but see God not only starts over with creation you know he created the world you know man messed it up and he's going to start over again but in a sense he also starts over with our salvation so in Romans 8 just share a couple of verses here it says here for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, 
to wit, the redemption of our body. So when a person gets saved, they are given the Holy Spirit as an earnest. You know, they're born again, the Holy Spirit indwells them, and that's the first fruits of the Spirit. That's the, 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 the earnest of our inheritance. But God's not finished with our salvation there. You know, God wants to take this new wine, in a sense, and he wants to put it into a new bottle, bottle, the redemption of our body. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, we read a bit more. It says here in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, internal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would uh, be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. And uh, just one other passage, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Now to verse 50. It says here, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So there's that changing again. Um, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortality must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory so you see i think it's interesting there there's a couple of analogies that fit that parable you know the heaven and the earth being created is like that garment and you know god has given us that new wine that new wine of the spirit and god wants needs to put that new wine into a new bottle our salvation does not end at just um being born again now we're saved for forever but god still has many things in place in store for us now you know when jesus came in in luke 5 he did things that were different When Jesus came, you know, he did things that were against the established tradition. And one thing, if we just go back to Luke 5, uh, verse 39 there, it says, No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. You know, Jesus came, you know, and he went against the established traditions. But, you know, we, we as a people, we don't like change. I mean, even today, I'm sure a lot of you felt a bit uncomfortable because it's not what you're used to, right? This church is a little bit different. And what's what Jesus is saying there? He's saying when people drink old wine, you know, we're creatures of habit. We get used to that old wine. And even though new wine and better wine comes along, we still prefer the old wine. It takes a while for us to get used to this new wine because we're creatures of habit. And, then, you know, there are different reasons why it's hard to change. You know, either you just get comfortable in your routine um, sometimes people are lazy to change because change takes a bit of work um, and laziness is a factor of why people resist um, change. Um, sometimes you need to learn something new and I guess that's related to being lazy. Um, some people are scared to change. You know, maybe you're scared of uh, friends, colleagues, families, uh, you know, and even other people that go to church. You know, other uh, uh, bishops and um, uh, elders and, and other people out there that may criticize you for doing things differently and you're scared of that, uh, scared of what others will think. Sometimes you resist change just uh, due to traditions because it's just what you prefer. You've been doing it the same for so long that it's, it's hard to do something different. You know, sometimes it's pride. Sometimes pride is the reason why we don't change because y in order to change, you have to admit that you weren't doing it the best way or you have to admit that you weren't doing it the right way, or that there's a better way to do it. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes traditions become such a part of us that, you know, it's, all, you know, uh, it's like with the, the Orthodox and the Catholics, you know, their traditions become a part of them, that they become proud of it, um, and they resist change. 
And you know, we can have different opinions on methods, that's fine, and some people have different uh, opinions, and, and that's another reason why they change. But let me say this, you know, I realize that there are different, different opinions on how the best way to do things is, but I do want to say this, that you know, there's nothing wrong sometimes with old wine. You know, sometimes there's nothing wrong with old wine and doing things a certain way. But one thing I do want to say is, is when the new wine is Jesus, when the new wine is the Word of God, it's, it's time to stop drinking old wine, don't you think? If there's, if there's a way that the Bible tells us to do something, and churches have just been doing it the same way again and again and again, drinking this old wine, it doesn't matter whether we're used to the old wine. When the new wine is Jesus Christ and His Word, it's time for us to stop drinking the old wine and get on to the new wine. And you know, I, I pray to God uh, for myself, for the humility to to be able to change because you know obviously the things that we're doing today uh, you know my opinions my preferences with what I believe the Bible is teaching but you know I want to make it really clear I really hope uh, this is how I come across in my relationship with everybody here is that you know if I'm wrong you know if the Bible teaches something else I want to know because I want to change you know I want to do I want this church to to, to be as biblical as possible. And so if there's something that, that you believe in the Bible that is contrary to what uh, we see, you know, let me know, we can discuss it. Some, you know, maybe we just have to agree to disagree, but, but I want to hear it. And, and hopefully you know, I do come across as approachable. Um, I, I really don't want you guys to be scared of me at all. You know, you know, I know sometimes it happens in churches because you, know, you, may, you may voice a concern and then what gets preached next Sunday, it was whatever you, your concern was voiced. And it's sometimes it's in a way that's not very loving. Um, so, you know, I'm not perfect. You know, if I do that, I really apologize. But I, I, I really am praying and hoping that, you know, I can be a leader in this church that listens to you guys. Um, but first and foremost, you know, I want to glorify the Lord Jesus in this church. Um, so, you know, if you do have a suggestion, it has to start with the Bible says this. Uh, you know, it can't just be, well, I think, you know, this is better. You know, well, that's great, but you need to prove it from the word. Um, sometimes people think of me as very close-minded and I don't listen. It's not that I don't listen. Sometimes I just don't agree because you don't have any scripture to back it up. Or you haven't answered why this other scripture that contradicts your opinion, if there's a better explanation. I mean, if you can explain all the scriptures that have to do with that topic, I'm all ears because I want to know what God's word says too. But you know, what are some things that are going to be different in the church? And I'm just going to brush over them quickly because there's probably some things you guys are, are wondering about. <clears throat> and I guess as we go uh, further and further you know, into to learning about these things, I'll explain more uh, why I have these differences. But I would say the first one that's the most obvious, and, and I don't know whether we'll get criticism for it, but you know, who really cares? But it's the church name. You know, so we did not decide to call this church whatever Bible word Baptist church and you might be asking is it because you know you're ashamed of being a Baptist no is it because whatever other reason no I'm not ashamed that you know technically we are a Baptist church right because we baptize by immersion and we believe the Bible is the word of God I just didn't decide to put it in the church name and the, and my reasoning behind that was you know, I'm a very, I have a bit, a bit of OCD, <laughs> I would say, and micronized in the sense that I'm very particular about certain things. And I, I so when it comes, when it came to the church name, I know it's, it's, it's probably not even that important, but I, I was thinking about it a lot. And I just think if I chose a name, like a word, I was worried that, you know, later on, I might not like that word or, you know, it, it, maybe it's not relevant anymore or whatever. Um, but in terms of why I didn't keep Baptist in the name is because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I know I realized the pros and the cons, but I wanted a name that was based on the Bible. And I asked myself, well, if Jesus was to refer to our church, what would he call it? And we have an example of that in the Bible. We turn to Revelation and we see the church in Sardis, the church in Pergamos, the church in Philadelphia, the church at Ephesus. You know, why did I choose in instead of of or at? Well, I, I guess it just rolled off the tongue a bit better, right? The church in Punchbowl, that's how we, we use it. So I chose the church in Punchbowl because I thought, you know, if Jesus was to refer to our church, what would he call it? He would call it the church in Punchbowl. And to be honest, I, I don't think it matters, you know, really what our name is because 
you know, I think we only needed a name just so we could have a, a, a website so that people would know how to find us. So that's why I end, in the end I decided, you know, I wouldn't choose a name that was based in, in, in history. I wouldn't choose a name that was based on a tradition or a movement or even a man, you know, John the Baptist. Um, I, don't, I didn't even want to choose a name based on people's perception because some people choose the name because they think, well, you have a good association or you have a bad association because those things change. You know, I wanted to choose a name where it's not going to change and I have a, 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 a scriptural principle for why the church name is the way it is. So if you're wondering why we chose the church in Punchbowl, it wasn't just to be vague because we didn't want people to know what we believe. I mean, you know, read the website and see if you think this is a church that is scared about what people think we believe. And I'm still working on it and, and want to put more information on there. You know, and, and we don't have to bank off other people's perception. Why don't we just pave a new path and, and we'll create uh, what people think about this church and not have to, uh, you know, bank off what other people have made a name mean and have to uh, re-explain it. So that's one thing. Another thing that's going to be a bit different. If you notice on the website, I, I really wanted to make a distinction between a church gathering and a church service. You know, generally we call what we're doing here a church service and I really want to move us away from that because, you know, when you think of the word service, it's like you're coming to get served. That's not what church is about. You know, yes, you do get served, but that's like should be the lowest of your priorities. When you come to church, it, it, you're coming to be part of this gathering. You're coming to serve Jesus Christ. You're coming, to, you're coming to serve others. So I want to get away from this calling it a church service because that's not what we're putting on here because I don't expect you to just come here and sit through something and then go do what you really want to do. You know, you ought to come here and want to be part of this group want to encourage and exhort one another to, to, to go and knock the doors, win more souls, become more effective in our witness, uh, become more knowledgeable in our Bible, grow in our walk. Um, so we want to refer to this as a church gathering. I mean, you don't have to use the word gathering, but, you know, I guess group or congregation or whatever word you want to use. I guess gathering is the most fitting that I think. And you, you might think, well, what difference does it make? Well, it makes a difference in what people think about church. You know, the, the, way, the way we call things is going to change what people think about it. And we keep calling church a service, a service, a service, a service. That's what people are going to think it is, and we don't want people to think that. It's like if you keep calling the, this building a church, and you keep saying, oh, look, there's a nice church, and there's a nice church, and there's a nice church. If you keep calling buildings a church, that's what people are going to think. People are going to think a building is a church when it's not. So we are part of the problem in determining what people think out there. You know, we want to be the salt and light of this world, but if the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be seasoned? You know, if we are not clear, if we give an uncertain sound with the trumpet, you know, who, who's going to know um, what we're talking about? So I want to make that distinction there. You know, church is the whole time we're together. It's not just the preaching. That's why I wanted to have a time of prayer. I wanted to have reading. You know, I want you to stay and eat with us. And, and fellowship with us because that is part of church. Church doesn't end at the closing prayer. You know, church is here when we're together, when we're assembled together. Um, it's not just the sermon. It's not just, you know, if, if church was just the sermon, am I the church? You know, are you guys here just for me? You know, don't just come here just for me. Don't lift me up above other people. You've got to be here for everyone. You need to be here not just for yourself, not just for me, but be here because you want to be part of the body uh, of Jesus Christ. So that's what I want to I want to emphasize is you know this is a church gathering and, and you can't be part of it. Um, you know and that's why you know this is why we don't have any child minding services. You know we don't have a separated crèche. You know we don't send our kids across the road to another building because we believe that church is the gathering here and we want everyone to be a part of church. We want the kids to be part of church and it doesn't matter if they're making noise and they're playing around on the chair, they're walking around they are seeing what church is like and they are learning because it's amazing. I think that Simon and Timothy are not paying attention in church, but then they come home and then they play church and they know everything that's going on. They know that people get up and they sing and they preach and, um, and it's just great to know that even though they may not be just sitting quietly still as well behaved as your kids are, Kevin. Hopefully my kids get to that point. But you know, they're, they're sitting there, but they are absorbing it all in and, and I thank God for that. You know, so we want children to be part of the church. 
Because if you're not in this group here, how can you be part of this gathering? Um, but number two, you know, is to keep them safe from evil people. You know, we don't want to separate off our kids and, and put somebody in charge of them where they're not supervised and God forbid something terrible happens to them. And number three is, you know, we don't want to take adults out of the church because when you take children out of the church, you need adults to supervise them and now adults are taken out of, take, are taken out of the church. So we want everyone to be part of the church and that's why the, the children are here. You know, here's a, another thing I wanted to address as well that might be a bit different is you, you're probably wondering, you know, what do I call Victor? You know, and I've talked to you guys a bit about this before. You know, on the website, there's a reason why I put bishop instead of pastor, because I want to get back to Bible words and words that the Holy Spirit uses. Um, you know, and I realize that pastors are a shepherd, and that's what bishops do. But my position is the bishop of this church. That's what the Bible calls it. There's bishop and there's deacon. And just like calling it a service or calling it a gathering, you know, that'll never change unless it changes with us. If we keep saying, you know, the pastor of the church, pastor of the church. You know, I realize, I'm not upset if you say that or anything, but I really like, and I even find myself saying it too, so, but it'd be great if we could change that because people will say, oh, you know, bishop, it sounds Catholic. But, you know, does Trinity sound Catholic? You know, does Jesus sound Catholic? I don't care if the Catholics use a word. I think we should take it back. You know, instead of everyone thinking that bishop is some guy in a dress in, in the Catholic church, why don't they think of somebody that's a man of God, uh, that, that met the qualifications in a church, that's sent out, that's starting a church, that preaches the Word of God, that believes the Word of God, that's a bishop. And, and let's get people thinking that. But in terms of what to call me, you know, to be honest, you know, I don't mind if you just call me by my first name. Don't think that I think you're being disrespectful if you don't call me Pastor Victor or Bishop Victor. And in fact, I feel a bit uncomfortable when people call me that because maybe it's my background, maybe it's my culture. Because in my culture, if you call somebody Mr. Tay, that is actually a way that you distance yourself from them. Um, you know, my, my dad especially. Like, if you were to call my dad Mr. Tay, to him, that is you putting him on a different level, not wanting to be close to him and distancing yourself. But if you call him Uncle Seong, well, to him, that shows him that, you know, you want to be part of his family, you want to be close. So this idea of respect is not just a, a clear line because you know, res we need to be respectful of everybody. But different people um, have different opinions on how to be respected. So in terms of myself, you know, I don't think it's disrespectful to just call me by my first name. Um, I actually think it's unscriptural to call somebody pastor so-and-so because you don't have any uh, example or... Uh, precedent in the Bible of anybody being called by a title. In, in fact, the only time you see it, and you can, you can look into this yourself, uh, is when Paul is referred to as our beloved brother Paul. So if you really want to call me something, just call me brother Victor. But I don't mind if you just call me Victor, but don't feel the need to call me, you know, Pastor Tay or Bishop Tay. Um, I'm happy with you just calling me by my first name. And, you know, I don't mind if other people, you know, prefer to be called Pastor. You know, that's, 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 that's their opinion. I think it's fine for us to just have our own opinions on what respect is, but just so you're wondering, so there's not that awkwardness when you say, oh, I'll see you, Pastor Victor, or whatever. You can just call me Victor, it's fine. <clears throat> All right, another thing. You know, why are we meeting in this house? Um, the main reason why we wanted to meet in a house, you know, obviously we do have um, Bible verses that show us that churches met in houses. My main reasoning behind, behind why we're meeting in a house is because we wanted church to center around the food. I find churches these days are centering around the preaching. Now, and I think where, when we read in the New Testament, it's really centered around the fellowship. They broke bread together house to house and they, they always ate. That's why I think the Bible makes it a point when they got together to pray, it was prayer and fasting because they got together and they didn't eat. Um, that's, that's my opinion on that. So I wanted our, where we met to be conducive for that. Um, so I thought it would be easier if I always lived where we met so there was somebody there to, you know, that's what we, we could keep the food there. We would have things to use to eat. It was just very troublesome to have to, you know, rent out a building and then bring everything there. We wouldn't be eating there. Everyone would have to move. That's my reasoning behind that. And also the fact that it's going to be cheaper. Because then you don't, we don't have to spend money renting a place and then also renting a house, you know. So the way, the way we decided to do this here is I pay $600 a week in rent. 
and we're planning on using any funds that come in to pay for $100 of that a week and that'll offset some of my rent and, and pay for this place that we use here and um, you know the extra resources that get used. You know, I realize money can be a, a sensitive topic, but if you have any questions about that, you know, just ask me. All right, another thing that's a bit different is, you know, why am I not wearing a suit? Well, you know, people think, well, you know, you're not wearing a suit. Are you trying to dress down? Well, well no, I'm not trying to dress down. Uh, people will say like, well, you know, do you not respect uh, what you stand for? Well, no, that's not why I do it. You know. They might say like, yeah, well, how do you dress for work? Well, you know, I work in a corporate environment. So I do sometimes wear a suit and I wear, uh, I dress up a bit. Or they say things like, well, you wouldn't dress like that to meet the Prime Minister. Well, I'm not going to address all those now, but, you know, basically my thought on this is, you know, when you read through the Bible, you know, can you imagine Jesus walking around in a suit? You know, when they came to arrest him, Judas had to kiss him to, to identify who he was because... He didn't stand out like everybody else. He just dressed how everybody else dressed. And that's why, you know, maybe you're looking at me now and thinking, oh, you know, I've dressed down a bit, but this is just how I normally dress. I'm just trying to look the same as everybody else because I believe that's how Jesus is. You know, and the main principle being that we dress modest. I, I don't believe if, if in our culture today, if you're in a three-piece suit with a tie, that you are modest. You stand out like a sore thumb. Um, so... That's why I just, just decided to dress uh, you know, casual because I, I don't believe church is meant to be a formal meeting. Because like I said, it's not this service, it's not this presentation that you sit through. I think we ought to think of church more like a family gathering. Now when you go to a family gathering, are you wearing a suit? No, right? You just come, you dress neat, you dress modest, and you just come along looking like everybody else. And, you know, I'm no different. You know, and that's why I decided, you know, I actually did make it a point. And I've been, you know, I know you guys that know me, I've been thinking about this. So I wanted to make a point because I wanted church to have that feel. And, you know, I don't care what other people think because even though we're putting these, these sermons on the internet and people are going to be able to criticize us, I want them to see how church should be um, and how I think it should be. All right, another thing that's going to be different. I, I decided in this church not to take up a public collection. And if you're wondering how to give to the church, you know, you can deposit it into the bank account. We actually haven't set it up yet, uh, but once we set it up, if you do want to give to the church, um, you can deposit it into the bank account. If you want to uh, give anonymously, there's actually a, a key return box just zip tied to the front door. So you can, you can chuck it in there if you want. But there's a reason why um, I, I didn't want to take up a public collection, and it's because I want to promote a spirit of cheerful giving. You know, and I don't want you to give because you're pressured into giving. I don't want you to give to the Lord's work because you're worried about what other people think. You know, I think it's something that should be done in private. It should be done anonymously or as, or as little people as knowing as possible unless you, you want people to let it know. You know, because if you let people know, I don't think it's necessarily boasting or anything because sometimes you want to give glory to God that um, we're doing something great. Um, and I, you know, I don't believe I don't believe tithing is a uh, is a New Testament thing that should be done. I don't believe that you know you have to give ten percent because in the end of the day, everything you own belongs to God. I think tithes were something to do with the Old Testament temple. So I don't believe in people giving because they have to give. I think giving is always voluntary. I don't think you have to give any sort sort of portion to this church because. At the end of the day, everything you have belongs to God. Uh, but if you want to support the work that we do here and, uh, and obviously help pay for the expenses, obviously it would be great to, to, to give to that cause that you believe in. All right, just a couple of other things as well. You know, why did we not decide to have a midweek um, or a Sunday evening Bible study? Uh, just a couple of reasons that I'll blow through. You know, number one, it was really hard to get to. I was saying that, you know, once you have kids, it, it really changes how you see things and how churches are run. It was really hard to get to for people. It was really stressful for mothers to have to get their children fed and then get to church on time. Um, you know, I, personally myself, you know, I didn't think I could keep up with preparing that many sermons a week as well um, because I do work a full-time job. You know, and, and generally people didn't really stick around for fellowship. Like you'd come, maybe you know, you know, have, have a time of prayer, have some preaching, and then people would zip off because they have to go to work the next day. So I thought, you know, instead of having the midweek and the, the Sunday evening making Sunday really long, I just thought we'd, you know, we'd just emphasize this gathering here. We'd make it a bit longer. We'd, we'd make it fellowship and it'd be a, 
uh, a bit more enjoyable. Um, you know, the Sunday evening, it just made th things really long. And, you know, if you, if you went soul winning in the afternoon, you didn't eat until much later after. So it wasn't conducive to have soul winning on Sunday and, and the two uh, church gatherings in the morning and the evening. And one thing I didn't like about the church evening gathering was it cut soul winning short. Because you would get out there maybe 2 o'clock and then you might be talking to somebody, but then you're thinking, oh, well, I've got to get back to church. Um, but, you know, I think it's, you know, if you, if you didn't have to come back, you know, you, you could keep soul winning and, so, and soul win a bit longer. Um, one thing we do plan on doing is after the soul winning is to come back for dinner. So for those of you who are going soul, even if you're not, I mean, you, we, we'll just come back and have dinner together. I think that would be a great, like, sort of finish up to soul winning. Because, you know, when you go out there, you're talking, you're getting really hungry. You don't have to go home and have to prepare. So if, if we come back, we can eat the le either the leftovers for lunch or those of us looking after the children can prepare um, dinner so that we can come back and, you know, we can share stories and, and, and share our experience. So that's my reasoning behind that. I, you know, I did try and make it a point, you know, that we don't have musical instruments. I, uh, you know, I, I did write Amy an email. Uh, my, my opinion at the moment is that I don't think it's something for the New Testament. I realize that in the Old Testament temple and in the temple in heaven of God, musical instruments are used. But what really struck me about it was, you know, why do we not see instruments used at all in the New Testament? Um, and in fact, the only, we don't really even see songs and music mentioned that much, except to actually sing to the Lord. So that's my position right now. I believe that it's, it's better to not have musical instruments. I think, you know, singing a cappella really brings out the meaning of the words a lot better. Uh, and I, but first and foremost, I think it's the uh, pattern that we see in the New Testament. But I am willing to be challenged on that. The last thing I want to mention, just in terms of things that are different, and I just want to close on a couple of other things, is one thing that's going to be different as well is you're going to learn doctrine on Sunday mornings. It, it always perplexed me why doctrine, the deep, meaty truths of God's word, were not taught when it was the most common time for everyone to be there. Do you know what I mean? Like, why would you teach the important doctrines of the faith, of the meaty truths, on a Wednesday night when you know 90% of the church is not going to be there? Why wouldn't you teach what is important and, and what really matters on the Sunday morning when everyone is there to actually learn? So, you know, when you come on Sunday mornings, to be part of this church, you know, get ready to, to learn something. Get ready to, to think and discuss and to talk about it because we want to get in the Word um, and, 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 and tackle those meaty truths on Sunday uh, at church. And, you know, I, I really hope that in this church that there are, there are no sacred traditions that get created um, that cannot be changed by the Word of God. You know, and I encourage you as a church to prove all things. Prove what you hear from this pulpit. You know, prove what anybody in this church says. You know, don't get offended when somebody disagrees with you. Just take that as an opportunity to learn, to prove all things, to discuss it and realize, you know, is what I'm believing actually line up with the Bible? I want to create an atmosphere here in this church that you can talk about the Bible, that you can disagree, and we shouldn't get offended because... Because honestly, guys, like, if you can't talk about the Bible here, where are you going to talk about the Bible? You know, the world doesn't want to talk about the Bible with you. So, you know, come here and talk about the Bible and don't get upset at somebody if they're talking about the Bible and it doesn't agree with what you agree with. Talk to them about it. You know, maybe you can win them over or they can win you. You know, let's just have this environment where, you know, we are all trying to learn what the Bible says. We can all learn something. So let's try and keep that attitude there. All right, Matthew 28. I just want to touch on a couple of things before I close here. Matthew 28. <clears throat> Oops, did I go to the right passage? Okay. Because what, what do I want this church to be about? You know, because there are things that are going to be different. There, there are things that we, you know, it might take you a while to get used to it, you know, and like I said, I'm always open to uh, your, your feedback on what can be done better. You know, but I understand that, you know, if we've been drinking old wine for a long time, you're not, you're going to straightway desire new. It's, it's, it's going to take a while before this new wine 
becomes the old wine. Um, but thank God for the new bottle. But, you know, the goal of our church and what, why we are even gathering here to be built up, that has not changed. Because the goal of our church and the goal of any church should be the same. You know, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So the goal of our church and the goal of any church, this shouldn't change. The goal of our church is to preach the gospel to every believer. It's to baptize them. It's to teach them the word of God. And that's where you're sitting here now, where we come and we learn and we discuss and we grow in our faith. Maybe the only difference is this church will actually do it. You know, and I want to make sure this church actually does it because, you know, the goal of every church is to reach their community. I mean, how sad is it when a church meets in an area and houses five doors down have not even had somebody knock on the door and try and give them the gospel? That is a sad state of affairs. I mean, if we are in Punchbowl, you would like to think that every person or every house in Punchbowl is going to get the gospel. And that's our emphasis here at this church. We are about reaching people with the gospel and I believe that if you grow in your witness, you'll grow in the faith. If you are trying to bear fruit, God is going to purge that branch that it will bring forth more fruit. So it's hard if churches are no longer doing the first step, which is preaching the gospel to every creature. I mean, are they really able to disciple people? Because that's part of the discipleship is getting people out there and, 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 and getting them preaching the gospel. So, you know, our goal of our church has not changed, but I want to make sure that we actually do it. So, you know, that we evangelize, that we <laughs> baptize, and that we discipleize, right? We discipleize. Uh, and, you know, discipleship, I haven't figured out exactly how we're going to do baptisms yet. My idea with baptisms is that we go to the local reserve, um, I think in Reevesby, and, and there's, a, there's a reserve along, uh, along the water there. And we, you know, I, I do want to make a big deal out of it. I don't like... Uh, you know, when baptism is just like a secret thing, you know, just in a bathtub or something like that. I think it'd be great if we, you know, make it a celebration, make a big, uh, big thing of it. I don't know who's going to be the first person we baptize, but hopefully it's soon. Um, and discipleship, you know, that's where you're sitting now. This is what church is. Um, and, you know, it's not just my job. It's not just my job to disciple people. It's everybody's job. We all play a part uh, in discipling each other and discipling our children. That's why it's so important that uh, the atmosphere at church is a godly environment. That's an environment that our children can grow up in. That, um, you know, that's why there are certain behaviors that are not welcome at this church. And, and I'll go into that another time. But I want you to realize the importance you play in that. That discipleship is not just not one person discipling everyone. It's everybody discipling everyone. We're a body here. And every part of the body uh, is important. You know, you, you are the church. Remember that. Like that, that, that is a, a really important truth to internalize. Don't ever get this mentality that, oh, you know, the church doesn't do this. The church should do this. As though the church is some entity outside of you. We are the church. Remember, the church is a group of people. It's not an organization that exists outside of the people here. So if you want this church to grow, you have to grow. If you want this church to know the Bible better, you have to know the Bible better. If you want this church to, to grow in its witness and, and, and be a soul winning church, you have to be a soul winner. So remember that, that you are the church. You know, everybody wants to be part of something that's already established, right? Everybody wants to be part of something that's already happening. But you know what? If, if that were the case, nothing new would ever begin. So I hope you guys get on board and make this church great because you know what? You know, I guess maybe I don't have the confidence in myself, but, you know, Jesus is going to make this church great. And if you want this church to be great, you've got to get involved and be part of that body and make it great. Because, you know, I'm just, I'm just one man. And you know what? You know, I thank God for this core group here today because I feel as though you guys are all here not because of me. You know, I know that. It's because God has spoken to you through his word and Jesus has built this church together. Like, you know, I, I can honestly say the people here today is none of my doing at all. But, you know, if a man stands up for the word of God, you know, I thank God that Jesus is building this church and, and, and the people that he's brought along here today. And I hope, you know, it continues. 
So let me just finish on this. You know, Jesus, you know, Jesus is building his, this church. And, and I thank God that he's doing that. And I thank God that the pressure is not on me to build this church because God's word is the one that's holding us all together. You know, Jesus said, you know, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And, you know, we're all excited here today for this new church. We're excited what Jesus is going to do in this new church. And I feel like, you know, it's time to storm the gates of hell. It's time, uh, you know, Jesus said, you know, he'll build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I feel this now is the kink in the devil's armor, uh, you know, that, that we've come out and we've gathered together and I'm really excited about, you know, the things that we're going to do, the people that are going to get saved, the people that are going to grow, you know, who we're going to meet. You know, like some of you guys, you just got in contact through the website and everything like that. I just think it's awesome to meet you guys. You know, and I'm excited because this is the first kind of church like this that I know of in Australia. Um, so, you know, it's great to be a, a, a pioneer of something different in this country. But let's just go to this last patch. It's 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 55. <laughs> you know, Satan can't stop us. You know, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. And you know what? We've already won. You know, it's not a battle where we're trying to win. We have already won. Um, and that's why it's time to storm the gates of hell together. Look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 15. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, so because we've got the victory, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, you know, we already have the victory, guys. We're not fighting this fight to win. We've already won. We're fighting this fight because we want to claim a larger inheritance, right? We're in the promised land already, and we're out fighting those fights to get an inheritance for, uh, for heaven and to reach more people with the gospel. So because we've already won, what's our job? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, that we stand for the truth, that we stand for the word of God, always abounding in the work of the Lord, that we abound in the work of the Lord, that we constantly are trying to do more and more for Jesus Christ, that we abound in the work of the Lord. And what's the frame of mind we should have? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So it's not vain. Your labor is not vain in the Lord. We stand for the truth. That's not vain. We abound in the work. That's not vain. It's not vain because we've already won. It's not that we have to do these things to win. We've already won. And when we do them, they're not vain. So it's not vain when you came to church this morning and you prayed. It wasn't vain when you came to church this morning and we read the Bible. It wasn't vain that you're here today and that you're building each other up. And you know what? Later on, it's not going to be vain when we go and knock on those doors. It doesn't matter what the response is. It's not vain when you're abounding in the work of the Lord because we've already won. And thank God for that. So that's all I really had to say this morning. Um, it, do any of the... Do any of the guys have any questions about that or anything you want me to clarify? Maybe, maybe today's sermon is not really uh, uh, something that you have questions about. Maybe I've talked to you guys about like this before. But I did want to give you the opportunity, but um, if there's nothing, no questions you have, all right, let's, um, let's pray and let's give thanks for the food. All right, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this church. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for this new bottle. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill it with new wine. Um, Lord, help us not to uh, just create other non-biblical traditions. Help us, Lord, to always be focused on your word, what your word says. Let's get our pattern from that. I thank you, Lord, for the people you've brought here. I pray, Lord, that we would grow together, that we would work together, that we would win the souls. And I pray, Lord, later on for the soul winning, that you would bless um, our work out there, that, Lord, you would, uh, we would see fruit, that we would see fruit that remains. Um, Lord, help us not to be discouraged if people are not willing to listen. Help us to know that our labor is not in vain. I thank you, Lord, that we can eat together now and we can spend time together. I pray you bless the fellowship and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.